This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily Bloomberg iHeart podcast. And I'm Stacey Marie Ishmel, Managing Editor of Crypto for Bloomberg News. It's Wednesday, September 14th. It's Merge Week, and my colleagues David Pan, Olga Karif, and Dave Litka hosted a Twitter Spaces dedicated to the coming changes to the Ethereum blockchain. That Twitter Spaces happened on Monday, September 12th. We captured their discussion live, and for this episode, you'll hear highlights from their conversation. Hi, uh, this is Dave Litka. I'm a senior editor at Bloomberg News. Uh, We're going to talk about the merge, which is the software update of the Ethereum blockchain network that is known as the merge. Joining me to discuss what all this means are Olga Grief, who's in Portland, and David Pan, who's with me here in New York. So, Olga, what exactly is going to happen and why should anyone care? So uh, basically, Ethereum is the most important commercial highway in crypto. This is where thousands of apps ranging from crypto exchanges to games live. And billions of dollars in value is being moved around here um, every single day. And uh, what's going to happen is the way that transactions are ordered on Ethereum is going to change. So today, very sort of power-intensive operations are happening to order transactions. A lot of electricity is being spent on this. And after the software upgrade, 99% of that energy spend will go away. And so Ethereum will become much more energy efficient and environmentally friendly. Otherwise, not much will change, but this upgrade will pave the way to additional upgrade that could make Ethereum faster and cheaper to use. What are some of the, or are there any disadvantages here, I guess is the question. You know, there are some people who say that uh, perhaps uh, Ethereum is not going to be as secure, it's not going to be as decentralized as it is today. But, you know, (laughs) there are a lot of disagreements over this. So uh, some people feel that way and others believe that this is not true. David, um, there's been a, what you could really characterize as a multi-billion dollar industry that's cropped up around um, Ethereum to what we call mine Ethereum right now or Ether. What's going to change there? Basically, I think the, the merge, one of the biggest implications for the merge is to boot off all these miners who have purchased billions of dollars worth of mining equipment for, you know, Ethereum mining. And it's certainly going to be a shock for at least the, the GPU market, you know, like a lot of the miners, they use GPUs to mine Ethereum. And at the same time, Ethereum mining services providers like the mining pools, they'll essentially stop uh, the mining services as well. It's a really big ripple effect on, on the mining industry. And um, Olga, just on a just on a more basic level on it. Um, Is there any going back on this? No, I don't think so. But uh, there are some groups of uh, Ethereum miners who are not okay with the change and they are going to try and essentially split off or fork off Ethereum in its current state and uh, with a few modifications, uh, essentially continue to run the Ethereum blockchain using miners. It's not clear how much support such an Ethereum fork or perhaps multiple forks will gain. Already uh, a couple of key participants in the ecosystem, such as uh, Chainlink, which provides Oracle data for a lot of uh, decentralized finance applications, and uh, Circle, which supports uh, USDC stablecoin, which is widely used in DeFi, So, for instance, they came out and said they will not support Ethereum forks. And that means that most um, decentralized uh, finance applications, for instance, will be broken on the forked off chains. So, you know, it's not clear how much value and how much activity we will see on this chains. But if um, history be our guide, you know, in the past, some of these forks have sort of lingered on and done fairly well, although their value ended up being much smaller than the 
chain that they forked off from. So I suspect that Ethereum proof of stake, which is what Ethereum will be called after this software upgrade, uh, will be much, much more valuable than any of the forks. Is there any sense on um, who will be the biggest winner out of all this? Or is that even a way to kind of measure things? I think uh, sort of one way to think about it is uh, if um, Ethereum is considered to be more environmentally friendly, then a lot of uh, companies and investors that perhaps stayed away because they were worried about its uh, environmental footprint might actually uh, join the Ethereum ecosystem with developing applications for it or investing in in Ether or related coins. So I think that's probably, uh, you know, the Ethereum ecosystem could benefit from it hugely if, again, the software upgrade goes off without, without a hitch. And that's a big if. One thing I will add is, you know, like uh, decentralized exchanges like Coinbase, uh, who are providing uh, staking services, I think they, they are among the biggest winners. You know, I, I think uh, we reported previously that revenue generated from uh, staking services at Coinbase is, is like one of the largest uh, parts in, in their non-trade revenue, you know, as the trading fees are decreasing, you know, with more competition between exchanges and staking programs offered by exchanges. I think they are emerging to be a major revenue stream for uh, for exchanges like Kraken and Coinbase. What is it going to mean for people who actually use the Ethereum blockchain? This is supposed to be a seamless transition to after the, the upgrade here, at least on the software aspect on it. How about from the user perspective? In terms of the users on Ethereum, they will barely notice the changes. But I would say like the validators, the people who are replacing the miners, um, they have to do a lot of the work. They have to upgrade the software and sync the two layers, the consensus layer uh, and also the execution layer. They have to make these two layers uh, being upgraded and, um, you know, simultaneously to make sure that, you know, there, there are as few missing blocks as possible during the process. So... In terms of the user experiences, they won't notice that much. With the movement away from miners um, to validators, it's a, it's a little bit of a power dynamic. Who are some of the big winners in this? It's an interesting change because previously we had miners and now we will have sort of three type of entities. They will be validators, which will stake coins to put transactions blocks into the blockchain and there will be so-called block builders which will take transactions package them into blocks and will send them on to validators via relays and at this point it looks like most builders are also relays so at this point we have sort of two new entities essentially appear to to be in charge of ordering transactions on ethereum so they're builders, block builders, and validators. And we already know that there are thousands or tens of thousands of val validators out there. What's interesting is that as of right now, there is just uh, actually less than a handful of block builders out there. And so something that the industry is, is watching closely is to see, you know, will we see more competition among builders of blocks? Because this could be sort of a pain point in terms of the centralization, potential centralization in Ethereum. And also, you know, potentially this could uh, if there are only just a few builders, these builders could have a lot of power over how transactions sort of happen on Ethereum. So this is one place that the industry is watching closely. We'll be right back with more from Dave Litka, David Pan and Olga Karif talking about the merge. You're hearing their voices from a Twitter spaces that we held on Monday, September 12th. An interesting side note is Bitcoin. If 
the merge is successful and it does push Ethereum in the direction that you two have both talked about on it. What may be some of the consequences for Bitcoin? I personally am not sure that there will be any consequences for Bitcoin. There will certainly be more pressure uh, potentially to move it to proof of stake. But I think most of Bitcoin supporters just don't want to go there. They believe that proof of work is a superior system to proof of stake. They believe that it's it's been proven over the years, it's stable. And essentially the sentiment is, you know, it's as good as it's going to get and let's keep it the way it is. But I think uh, what Ethereum's changes could do is most definitely push new blockchain development efforts to launch chains based on similar technologies. So I think proof of work is not something that developers of new chains are going to consider doing. David, how about the political dynamic here? I think Olga is absolutely right. You know, like people who firmly believe in Bitcoin, um, you know, they they do not buy in um, proof of stake. But the flip side of proof of work for Bitcoin is the environmental concerns. And for example, a lot of countries in Europe, they were discussing uh, about the plan to ban POW tokens, you know, tokens that are under the consensus mechanism of proof of work. Certainly, uh, because of the transition to proof of stake for Ethereum, there could be less policy risks or regulatory risks, at least from the energy perspective. How are you two tracking this and uh, how will we know? There are a number of websites that are basically tracking the merge. Essentially, the exact timing of the merge will depend on um, sort of what's going on with mining support of the Ethereum network. If the hash rate, you know, which is the computing power for the entire Ethereum network, drops significantly, if we see a very drastic drop, that also signals that, you know, the merge is nearing the end of the process. I'd like to thank uh, David Pan here in New York and Olga Kreef in Portland for joining us on the Spaces. This is Dave Litka for Bloomberg News. On the next episode of Bloomberg Crypto, we're going to talk about crypto gambling, specifically gambling for crypto on platforms like Twitch. Twitch is one of the most popular video streaming platforms anywhere in the world. And if you haven't heard of it, you've definitely heard of the company that owns it, Amazon. This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Send us your comments, questions, or suggestions for the show to crypto at Bloomberg.net. Or find us on Twitter, we're at Crypto. The supervising producer of Bloomberg Crypto is Vicky Vergolina. Our senior producer is Janet Babin. Our producer is Sharon Barrero. Associate producer is Ty Butler. Desta Wonderad is our engineer. Original music by Leo Sidron. I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael. We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>